All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at the closing plenary session for the 2023 Social Workers Confronting Racial Injustice Conference. My name is Bethany Matson. I am one of the community co-chairs for the conference and so honored to be here with you all to introduce and host this closing session with the amazing Amani Barberin. Um, before we jump into our closing, just a couple of things. Um, Want to welcome you all. Our conference this year has been around centering disability justice. And I will say for our amazing conference planning committee, we have learned so much even since the conference started. We learned quite a bit in this process of planning around like disability justice and what it means to make a conference like this truly accessible to people. And even last week when we opened after our conference session, we were continuing to learn so many lessons um, and so many places where we can continue to grow and improve. And so thank you all for being here, for giving us grace as we really truly dig deeper into our own um, place in disability justice. Um, it has been an amazing journey. And this conference has been just absolutely incredible. Um, we opened our conference with an amazing open and plenary um, and our breakout sessions. I've just been hearing so many great things. I wish I could have attended them all. But luckily for me and for all of you, all of our sessions will be recorded and available um, on our conference website shortly. So please look out for those um, coming soon. And so before we start, I also think it would be just really important for us to pause and hold some space for the things that are happening in our country right now. Um, when I'm speaking about the murder of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee, and I want to hold space for the fact that those who watch the video or chose not to watch the video, the ongoing trauma and anger and rage and frustration that we all should feel with watching the state murder folks um, is real. And I wanna hold space for that and hold space for all of you. And I don't want it to be lost on the fact of things that are happening in our country, like in Florida, where topics around race and DEI and critical race theory and all of these things are really becoming these ridiculous political stance that folks are taking. Um, and so I want to just, again, extend thanks to the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work for continuing to give support to this conference when so many universities have started to already turn away from doing this work and giving social workers access to the things that we need in order to actually serve the community. So thank you to the school for doing that. Um, and I just wanna validate that with everything happening in this country, all the things that you are feeling, um, all, the, all of the, the, again, the anger and the rage are valid. And it's not the irony of folks saying that we need to work to make people comfortable. We need to not <laughs> rise up in violent protests. It's not lost on me the irony that that comes from people who are trying to erase the true history of this country that was built on the backs of enslaved African folks and the genocide of indigenous people. And now we are given this message for this generation, generation and those moving forward that we need to make people comfortable and not talk about those things and not be real and not say what is actually happening. So, um, and with that, we move into our land acknowledgement about being on stolen land. So I will um, say that we are here, this conference, for those of us who are in uh, Madison here, we are 
on indigenous lands. Um, I am on Ho-Chunk land, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who sponsors this co this conference is on Ho-Chunk land. And on behalf of the planning committee for the social workers confronting racial injustice conference, I ask that you join me in acknowledging that our campus here on the shores of the Juan Schick Home Ikla or Lake Mendota resides within the sacred homeland of the Ho-Chunk people, a place they call De Jope or Four Lakes. As the reach of the university extends to the far corners of our state, we also respectfully recognize the inherent sovereignty of the 12 nations of Wisconsin pictured here on our map. Whether you are watching this from the land of these 12 First Nations or you are more distant, we encourage you to learn about the history of the land you are on. Our land grant university could not have been established or sustained were it not for state and federally sponsored settler colonialism that dispossessed and displaced American Indian nations and communities across our state. We must now confront the outcomes of unjust land treaties and the harm caused by our university's past complicity with policies of cultural and physical genocide as we seek reconciliation with indigenous nations and communities of Wisconsin. As social workers, we have a duty to look critically at our role. Our role has played in the attempted cultural genocide and destruction of indigenous families, such as was the aim of boarding schools in this state and across this continent. This conference is rooted in critical reflection of our work as social workers. Our goal is to bring clarity about the past, but also to challenge and inspire us all to move into action in our work in communities once the conference is over. We hope this conference provides space for critical reflection humility and openness, which will allow us to reflect, to hear and tell truths and move toward action and transformation to support indigenous rights, cultural equity and racial equity. With acknowledgement and gratitude, we move forward today in our journey. The fact that we are on Ho-Chunk land in the way that we are on it is not separate from what we are gathered here to do today. And it is not. And in saying that, I need to apologize because I did not provide a physical description of myself. As you all have noticed in um, our conference, we are again centering disability justice and we have worked really hard and many, many thanks to the McBurney Center for providing us with captioning um, and our ASL interpreters who have been amazing through this conference. But again, my name is Bethany Matson. I'll do a proper introduction. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a 40-year-old Black woman with short brownish blonde hair, wearing gold frame glasses um, and gold hoop earrings and a red lipstick, wearing a Black t-shirt that says Amplify Black Women. Yes, indeed. And against a Black Japanese blossom screen here. So now I want to move into what we all are here for, what I know I'm here for, and that is to welcome our closing plenary speaker, Imani Barberin. And before I bring Imani up to the stage, I just want to tell you all a little bit about her. Um, first of all, if you are not following Imani on social media, you definitely should be. <laughs> um, she is on social media um, as Crutches and Spice and amazing. Imani is a disability rights and inclusion activist and speaker who uses her voice and social media platforms to create conversations engaging the disability community. Born with cerebral palsy, Imani often writes and uses her platform to speak from the perspective of a disabled black woman. In the last few years, she has created over a dozen trending hashtags that allow disabled folks the opportunity to have their perspectives heard while forcing the world to take notice. Hashtag patients are not faking. Hashtag things disabled people know. Hashtag ables are weird and others provide a window into disabled life while forming a community. Imani is from the Philadelphia area and holds a master's in global communications from the American University of Paris. 
Her published works include those in Forbes, Rewire, Healthline, Bitch Media, and more. Again, she runs the blog Crutches and Spice and a podcast of the same name. So please help me welcome Imani Barberin. Hi, Imani. Thank you so much for introducing me, Bethany. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, My name is Imani Barberin. I am currently sitting in my living room. I'm wearing a pink sweater and I have uh, below shoulder length red dreadlocks. I am an African-American woman in her early 30s. Um, I wanna thank you all for asking me to be here today. I was speaking backstage before we started and I said that one of the things I've always wanted to do is get my hands on social workers. There are three groups I am constantly trying to interact with and those are medical professionals, teachers, and social workers. You all play a very pivotal role in the lives of disabled people. Um, I'm currently on unceded Lenape land outside of Philadelphia. Um, and acknowledge that this land was stolen and that we really need to give land back to its rightful stewards. Um, I wanted to sit here and talk to you today about a very pivotal moment in my life. Um, But I first wanna start with a little bit of a history lesson. From From the 1860s until 1974, disabled people were not provided the ability to move freely or to dictate our own lives. Um, Around that time, there were laws in place called ugly laws or public ordinances that prohibited us from being in public. That being said, we were institutionalized en masse. We were also forced to join circuses. And a lot of times we were killed. When we talk about disability history, we must start at the places where we are least seen because that is one of the indications, one of the threads that keeps us unseen today. We cannot forget our history if we are to confront our present. So during this time, disabled people are institutionalized and harmed by the system at large. And around the 1970s, many reports started coming out about the conditions of disabled people in state-run institutions for the quote unquote mentally feeble and infirmed. Disabled people were living in squalor and living in their own filth, not being taken care of. Um, Disease spread quickly. Pregnancy was rampant, even though they were not able to consent for many of them, many of the disabled people living there. This is a part of disability history. And so autonomy and the ability to move freely was not in our own hands. After, around the 70s, we, the United States began a program called the Protection and Advocacy Agencies, making sure that disabled people were moved from these institutional settings to the community. However, they did not have the infrastructure to do so en masse. Disabled people are still living in institutions across the country we must make sure that we are continuing to close these facilities and move disabled people to the community. To this day, disabled people, as we are quote unquote coming out of the pandemic, are facing a lot of the exact same hurdles towards public life, towards our ability to direct where our lives should be and where we want them to be. And that's where social workers come in. Social workers are the intermediary between a society that wants to institutionalize us and keep us hidden and the world and the lives that we want to live. You are our advocates at our most vulnerable. And in ensuring that you are involved in disability justice means that we are included in society. We must make sure today and always that we are keeping in mind how disability is structured, how it is, how it inter- interacts with our daily lives, and that we are too vulnerable due to the ways in which health is weaponized against us in a society that does not want to see us live. One of the things I try to remind people of at, at every juncture when I speak, when I'm in person, is that you are fragile. 
who you are, your body, your mind is fragile. And we live in a society that will weaponize health, disability, and disability status against individuals and communities at large. Communities of color in particular bear the brunt of disability in our society. Indigenous folks to the United States have a rate of disability of 30%. Black folks have a rate of disability of 25%. Two groups in the United States that have been that, that have been chased by the United States desire for their eradication. It is no coincidence that they also have the highest rates of disability. We must keep this in mind if we are to build societies and programs and power structures that lead us toward liberation and community. When we talk about disability, I like to think of it I like to think of ableism as a weapon. Ableism is the structural, interpersonal, and societal preference for quote unquote normal, non-disabled bodies. Ableism is institutional, institutionalized in every single aspect of our society. And it could be as simple as a coffee shop not having a ramp, or even the place where you vote not having accessibility. It is interwoven into our society because we live in a society that did not see us for hundreds of years, that did not interact with us. We were institutionalized and locked away. So when we ask for equality, when we ask for access to the world around us, it is, it is going to sound like too much. But, it, but what we have right now is not enough. For disabled people, we are constantly told that our inclusion is unnecessary to society, that we should be grateful we are allowed to be uh, allowed to live, that we are allowed to draw breath. But I would argue that disabled people are some of the most integral members of our society because we could see the connections where non-disabled people miss them. We can see how food deserts and lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables leads to disability. We can see that the negligence as it pertains to our environment and our planet and, uh, and making sure that we are saving our planet for the future, that that's gonna impact disabled people the most. We can tell you, we can tell you that if you are pro-woman or if you are pro-gender um, equality, that women have the highest, that women with disabilities have the highest rates of domestic violence and sexual violence. We can tell you that our systems are designed to disable you. So not paying attention is leading, leaving not only us behind, but yourselves. As long as people can wield that weapon against you, you were not safe, you were not liberated. Disability, unless it is taken care of, unless we are interacting in a way that is inclusive of disabled people, we are not walking towards liberation. If you miss disability, you're missing the entire picture. So how are you at interacting with your communities in kindness, in inclusion? How are you walking forward or moving forward with disability always on your mind? Because we have to have it always on our mind. Inclusive societies are built from the ground up. So who are you talking to every single day? Are you talking to your elderly neighbors? Are you talking to the disabled community members you have around you? We must always be asking ourselves those questions. And as we as, as we as a society pretend to come out of COVID, we must ask ourselves, if the onus is on us, if the onus is on us to pave the way forward, what are we prepared to do? As we exit or pretend to exit a mass disabling event, how do we hold space for people who are newly disabled? people who are fearful of a system that they have not 
had to interact with until this moment? How will you as social workers serve as intermediaries and therapists between a world that wants to keep disabled people isolated and the freedom and liberation that we seek, that we want, the self-directed lives that we are entitled to but do not have access to. We must think about those things as we continue in this pandemic and it will not go away, unfortunately. We must recognize that we have to keep each other safe and we have to keep keeping each other safe as a continual process. Showing up for people is a continual process. Providing access is a continual process. Lastly, I want you all to make sure that you are unraveling your own internalized ableism as you see the through lines of how your health is being used against you. I always ask people I speak to to evaluate the tasks in their daily life that they're doing just to perform ability. Are you performing ability because you know that, dis that performing disability means you are disposable? And what does that look like for you? Does it mean that you do chores or things that could wait a day or hour, maybe? Does it mean that you overextend yourself at work? that you pour from an empty cup continuously, that is not sustainable. I would ask that you look internally and understand how the perceptions of disability that we live in and exist in and just are seep into our pores, how they impact how we treat ourselves. I want you to think about that as we move forward because you cannot pour from an empty cup and you cannot treat people with kindness if you are not prepared to treat yourself with kindness and grace. I implore you all to do that. I wanna thank you all for inviting me to the Social Workers Confronting Racial Justice Conference. And I look forward to this moderated conversation. Bethany. Afros. Everything froze. Everything just froze for me. I, I can see you. Everything froze for me. Okay, here I am. I'm sorry. No <laughs> Thank you so much for those comments, Imani. And you said performing ability and my mind was like, whoa, like, I, I just want to like, talk more about that of like, when you talk about performing ability, because there was, um, I remember watching, I think it was one of your um, TikToks, and you talked about, um, like, people who have like vision issues, and like, clearly, I have vision issues, and talked mm -hmm. about like, you know, if it, if it wasn't for like, these guys, I couldn't, I couldn't do this. I wouldn't be able to, I don't know that I would be able to do anything because my vision is horrible. Um, mm. My vision is just like really bad. Um, and so that just made me think about like when you said performing ability. And so I want to just talk a little bit more about that and what it looks like because in social work, in, in school, one of the things that is like pushed on us is this idea of self-care. And mm -hmm. self-care has been really co-opted into this thing where we're like treating ourselves or really indulging in like really expensive things um, that probably are not accessible for a variety of reasons to most of us who are in social work. And so I was thinking about that as like, a way of, of performing ability and how it is steeped in like social work and what we learn in, in doing this work is how to perform ability, right? So how what are some other ways that, that you see that showing up in, in folks and um, how they like live their lives on a, on a daily basis or, or sh show up in a daily basis, on a daily basis? 
So it's really interesting. I think um, I see a lot of people, particularly with invisible disabilities, performing ability, um, overextending themselves, clearly struggling, but knowing that if they falter at any moment, they could get fired or they can, their community will not accept them in certain spaces. Um, and you see that quite often. One of the most prevalent examples though, is whenever you hear the case of a black person that was killed by police. Um, and Tyree Nichols is somebody who had a disability. Um, he had Crohn's disease. He weighed 150 pounds. Um, and if you're disabled, you are more like, you're, if you're disabled and black, you're more likely than non-disabled black people to experience police violence. Um, but we have this idea that people have to be perfect victims. Um, mm -hmm. That you took a life that was productive. Mm -hmm. You took a life that was a valuable member of society. Not, not, not with a disability. No, no, that's not something that we talk about. No, they are somebody that was a member of this community and deserve to be here because they, they have ability, they have productivity, they have all this value to society and you took them from us. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't tell the whole story about how policing or society works. And I think that people hide their disabilities because they know of the implications of what it means to be open and visibly disabled and need things and need things from society and need people to, to show up and provide space for you. Um, they don't want to be seen as a burden or extra. Um, and it can be very detrimental to the ways in which we have conversations about literally everything. Um, and I don't think people are prepared to unravel how they want to be seen and understanding that it's okay to take rest. Um, it's okay to take moments to yourself. So, so uh, you know, I can't stand the commodification of self-care. Um, Audre Lorde was one of the first to propose it and it was really, like, I was reading her cancer journals, and it wasn't, like, bubble baths and roses leading to your, like, balcony or whatever. It was, what she went through was very difficult. It was very emotionally taxing to kind of go through your entire personhood and set boundaries for yourself about how you wanted to spend your time and your energy. That's what self-care is. And also you know, taking yourself out of certain situations when you know you are overextended. Um, and, you know, like she says, rest is a radical act. Um, mm -hmm. And making sure that you are not overextending yourself simply for the sake of being seen as productive. Mm -hmm. For sure. And one day this conference is probably going to be all about the problems with how we define and push self-care on social workers because it has be it is such a as someone I just graduated from the master's program at the university and so the way that it is talked about and and you know utilized it's it's almost becoming like a weapon of like putting us in line of like you must do this you must go get a manicure or a pedicure or something like that, instead of talking about like self-care as this very holistic and um, the idea of rest, nobody talks about about rest. We talk about 60 hour work weeks as being a sort of work ethic that we should adapt and take on. And so, yeah, that is a whole other conference. But I do want to ask you about um, defining uh hidden disabilities or invisible disabil disabilities, because I think there's been a, a lot of different takes on like what that means um, and like how we use those terms. And so for you, like when you are saying invisible disabilities, what what is that? What is your definition of that? What are you, how are you using that term? I did want to say something first. I think that social worker, weaponizing self-care against social workers makes sense because a lot of you work for nonprofits that have you working three to four different job titles mm -hmm. under one person. And so it's easier to push you off and be like, get a pedicure. But anyways, um, <laughs> what, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying. Um, but when it comes to um, 
when it comes to defining invisible disabilities, what I'm what I mean by that is our disabilities are conditions, body minds that are not readily seen as having a disability. We have a lot of symbolism when it comes to disability. Um, not so much glasses, like so, to some extent glasses, um, crutches, wheelchairs, walkers, it all has to do with like seeing mobility in, in particular. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what comes to mind when pe people think of visible disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, people may have an insulin pump that they have in their back pocket or they may have feeding tubes, they may have sensory um, disabilities and boundaries that need to be adhered to. Um, they may have, uh, did I say allergic to scents, like highly allergic to different scents, but, and just even food allergies are considered a disability. So there's a whole host of conditions that are just not readily seen to people that are kind of quote unquote invisible to society or hidden from society. Um, but that doesn't make them any less serious or any less prevalent. Um, and in fact, there, I would argue that there's far more people with invisible disabilities than with visible disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, particularly uh, when it comes to how people age and things like that. You just never know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's kind of what I mean by that. Okay. And I, I also wanted to go back to when you said like health, you said health being uh, weaponized against us, which is what mm -hmm. I thought of when I thought about self care, but even often as social workers, we talk about like mental health and physical health as two separate things. They are, they're the same, right? But because of the way our healthcare system is set up, they are not treated as the same thing. Like your, you, you don't have the access that you have for your physical health is very different from mental health and how that all works out. And so um, in thinking about how this idea of like, disability then is often tied into that, um, that weaponization of what is it and also just thinking about what's happening with with COVID and the fact that in the middle of a pandemic still we are ending COVID um, protections and access as of May. So we have like two months, two months is February left um, for people to have access. And I'm thinking about like, what happens when those in and when we talk about weaponizing health against us, what can you talk more about that weaponization, just like in general, but also with this huge um, thing happening here soon that will have an impact on all of us? Sure. Um, we live in a for profit healthcare system. Um, and when you become disabled, you are basic, you know, if you want support, if you need access to things like social security, um, income or Medicaid, you have income limits. Um, so basically, no matter what your socioeconomic status is under ultra rich, you, be, you could become very poor very quickly um, for needing that care because you're not allowed to make more than $2,000 in order to qualify for a lot of these programs, as you all well know. Um, and when we think about who actually becomes disabled, um, due to environmental factors, structural failures, um, it's people who are most marginalized have the highest rates of disability. Like I said, black people have a high a rate of disability of one out of four. Uh, indigenous folks have a rate of disability one out of three. Women have a rate of disability one out of four. Um, trans folks have a rate of disability two out of five. And LGBTQ folks have a rate of disability one out of four. So when we think about the representation of who has a disability, it is very largely, the burden is largely placed on communities that are already struggling. Um, and there's kind of like this switch that goes off, almost like it did with the pandemic, that when bad things happen to disabled people, that's what should happen. Like they weren't healthy. Mm -hmm. They weren't they weren't like really valuable either. So if bad things happen, if death happens to disabled people, then that's life, that's society. But when you see who's represented in that death, it paints a very stark picture of who's getting care and access and who is valued and um, kept alive by society. And so that's what I mean with the weaponization. And you could literally paint a line from any sort of social issue straight to disability. 
when it comes to COVID and these protections going away, I'm very fearful. Upwards of 14 million people will lose their health insurance because there was a rolling open enrollment period for COVID or Medicaid under the COVID emergency. Um, people are going to lose access to their health care and sometimes food stamps and things like that. Um, I'm very fearful of what's about to happen. And a lot of people are just kind of shrugging their shoulders. Um, we know who's going to get the most adequate health care. We know who's going to survive the hardest times. And not protecting the most vulnerable is, how do I put it? Negligence. It's negligent. Um, it really is. And we, and I feel some type of way too about the fact that we've had this major health care as a nation. We've had this very difficult time. And nobody, like, there's been no major effort to push for universal health care or universal um, basic income or something to protect people from, how, from the weaponization of their own health. And I get frustrated because so many people do not see it. And I get why. I get why. What's happening in Florida is obviously why. But people need to really, like, jostle themselves and wake up because they don't understand just how finite your marginalization can be when you become disabled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. You, you said a lot there and yeah, it is, it is scary that over these past few years, we, there were so many, there were many opportunities for us to talk about these things, to implement new things, universal health care, universal basic income, like all of these things for folks who are struggling. And all that we have talked about is like one people not wanting to work. Like how many times I hear that people not wanting to work. Well, if they are dying they can't work or they're dead because of the pandemic. They can't work or they've been disabled and, you know, they they are not going to show up again and work 60 hours a week for 725 hours. Like, I don't know what you expect. And those are the things that we're talking about. And then the stuff that's happening in Florida, which is a nightmare and nothing else. All all of the opportunities were wasted because of like this very capitalistic take on how we are supposed to to function as a as a country and it's all been very it's been a very sick process to walk to watch and still watch um, yeah. and I think as as social workers all of us who are watching who are social workers also should be just as as scared of what is happen what is to come once these things once these small little protections that we have end here in two months um i'm i'm terrified for it um because just this week i've dealt with four people who have had covid so for mm. folks to say it's over and that's a slow week um so for folks to say oh it's over i don't, i don't think that that is accurate but um yeah <laughs> so and you talk about this quite a bit on all of your um platforms and I do want to just like really quickly acknowledge like how you have used social media to build community and um just do really amazing things and like how that came about and um just just acknowledge the ways that you have used these platforms to really talk about a lot of these issues. So can you just talk about like kind of what started you with like building this, this platform and kind of where, where you see it going? Yeah. Um, I started my blog in 2014. Um, I had just graduated college the year before and I was kind of like, what do I actually want to do with my life? I was working as an assistant for a nonprofit, um, I'm not a good assistant. I will be the first. To, I'll be the first to tell you all. I'm awful. Um, I don't like. I don't like authority, and I don't like taking direction. So um, <laughs> there's that issue. Uh, but I really just wanted to find something that I could do long term. 
Um, and then I went and I was in, invited to the White House. They were doing, holding a session on African-American children in education with disabilities. And that was something I'd never seen before. And I went and I was just like, I was so emotional being in, in that, that space with that many black disabled people. I couldn't talk the entire time. And I realized how little representation black disabled people have or that's been spoken about openly and plainly. This disabled history runs parallel to black history. Uh, whether we want to talk about it or not, it's always been there. But I just wanted to write the write and create the representation that I always wanted to see and kind of write essays about growing up and you know becoming an adult with a disability because I really I rarely saw that. Um, and so I started crutchinspice.com and then I started tweeting about it because my mother stopped reading my blog. She was sick of it. She's like, I live this. I'm like, oh, she's like, I don't need to read it too. Because uh, I kept hounding her, like, did you read it? Did you read it? She's like, no, go away. Um, but that's kind of how it started. I started on Twitter and talking and then uh, started tweeting the hashtag Crypt the Vote alongside, it's, um, alongside thousands of other disabled people. I met so many disabled people through that. And then just started talking back and forth and comparing experiences and meeting other Black people. people. Um, and that's kind of really how it, it began. Awesome. And it is, it's amazing. I follow, I'm a, I'm a TikTok girly and I, I love it. So it's, it's just like very informative and, you know, in, in my own like learning and understanding of, of disability justice of, of, all like social justice, like having access to a variety of folks talking about these things that we often don't have people readily available to tell us about, like having that access has just been so wonderful and eye opening um, for me and you especially. So I just, I'm so like, <laughs> just grateful for you and, and so, so appreciative for the work that you are doing and really getting this this out there. And with that, we are going to take a short five minute break for everybody to gather their thoughts and put their, <laughs> their, get your, take care, take care of yourself, uh, get a water break, move your body. And then we come back, we have some amazing students who are going to join in, in this conversation with Imani. So we will be right back in about five minutes. So at two, we'll say two fifty.
are back everyone. Welcome back. Um, right now, I'm really honored to bring two amazing people to the stage to join in on this conversation. Um, the first is Naime, and I'm going to butcher your last name, so please charge it to my head and not my heart. Aguirre? Yeah, um, it's Naime Aguirre. Yes. Hi. Gosh, see, thank you. I apologize. Um, Naime is a Texas native currently residing in Chicago, Illinois, where she is employed as a therapist. As a social worker, she integrates disability justice, social justice, and math studies to support the mental health of neurodivergent folks. She identifies as a disabled Arab Latina woman. So thank you for being here with us, Naime. And next, I want to bring to the stage Sakara Wages. Sakara is a MSW and a doctoral candidate and graduate research assistant at UW Madison Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work. Sakara is also a lecturer at UW Platteville, director of programs and evaluations at the Progress Center for Black Women, and co founder of Black Platcom in Platteville, Wisconsin. Her research interests include Black women, non-state service providers, critical theory, and anti-oppressive uh, pedagogy. I can't say that word. Uh, forgive me. Pedagogy. <laughs> Pedagogies. Thank you, because I can't say it. Her personal interests include joy, autonomy, liberation, and disruption. Thank you all for being here today and being a part of this conversation. Um, I'm really excited to have both of y'all here and just to hear, like, get some questions going with Imani and get all of her good energy to all of us and, and bring y'all into it. So let's, let's jump right into it. Yeah. So before we started, I just want to give myself a description. So I'm a Black woman. Um, I'm 36. I have uh, chest length locks, um, soup to the side, shaved on the left. Uh, I have red framed, plastic framed glasses and tattoos and jewelry adorning. Good thing. And then uh, for my description, um, I am a 20 year old, 28 year old um, Arab Latina woman, uh, uh, light skinned, uh, wearing, uh, what is it? A white headband with medium length. Uh, brown hair. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and a yeah. So, um, yeah, that's how you can describe me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank y'all for that. Yeah. Um, so as you was talking, Bethany, I was just like, oh my goodness, yes, performing um, disability to me sounds so much uh, like performing whiteness, right? Um, so I think a lot about how social, the field of social work does or does not so, uh, prepare Black folks to serve Black people. Um, and, and one of the things that I've found in my experience, right, are there are these expectations about how you're supposed to show up um, and that prevents you from actually being a good student. And so as you were speaking, I'm just curious, right, like, I want to expand my understanding of ways that we can support Black disabled students in the field of social work, right? Because there are a whole host of extra constraints. You got an MSW field placement, right? So you have to worry about different accessibility in different places. You got very close time constraints, right? And so I just... I just was really curious about your thoughts about um, what we can do as a field to further enfranchise disabled folks so we can support them in this field. Sure. So one of the suggestions that I always uh, tell people, whether it be organizations or companies, is to think of accessibility like the Cheesecake Factory menu. Um, have you seen that thing? It's a book. It's a, it's a tome. 
Um, and what I mean by that is having as many options as available as possible so that people can kind of mix and match what works best for them. Also exposing people to what accessibility can look like. Um, there's a high learning curve when it become when you become disabled rather than when you're born disabled. I was born with my disability. I have had physical therapy, occupational therapy since I was two years old. Um, so my knowledge of what accessibility looks like is far different from somebody who became disabled from COVID or who became disabled in the last five years. Um, and that comes through with, you know, conversations, partnering with organizations to make accessibility fun and imaginative and exploratory. Um, I think that creating a culture of accessibility takes imagination and takes this idea of, of separating yourself from your expectations of how things should be or even how they should look. Um, a prime example is I wear sneakers everywhere. I have no, like, okay. I have some dress shoes, but primarily when I'm traveling, when I'm um, speaking, when I'm just walking through my neighborhood, I'm wearing sneakers. And for a long time, I felt really, I know it's, it's, it's not even like that serious of a deal, but I felt really compelled to wear shoes that were uncomfortable or painful to perform like belonging in spaces where it didn't really matter, you know? Um, and I would wear, I started wearing, you know, sneakers to church or wearing sneakers to dressier events. And I felt more comfortable um, despite the fact that I felt like I was a little bit out of place um, and kind of just unraveling these constraints around appearance and ability I think will serve everybody. Um, yeah, and it's okay to need accessibility. It's okay to do things differently. And we have a society that will punish you just for doing things that look different. Um, and also uh, um, uh, decoupling our idea of what time has to mean. Um, we had, you know, especially in black spaces, there's this idea um, of like communal space before like the task at hand. And that means you're gonna have to build inroads with people before you get to the nitty gritty of the conversation or the moment or the event. And building in those spaces is incredibly important and having face-to-face -face time or having time where you interact, even if it's virtual, just to speak and be in space with other people is incredibly important to black folk, to marginalized folk. So um, just understanding that things don't have to be how they've always been. Absolutely. My, first off, before I pass it on, I just want to say thank you because my mind is blown. I never thought about how folks with neural different sensory differences and uh, abilities differences, right, have to assimilate, right? Because if they perform an ability, right, there's some expectation that they will assimilate into this able space, right? And right. so um, thank you for that. Yeah. And I think, too, when it comes to there's this people want us to assimilate, but they don't ever expect us to fully assimilate, right? Like there's this idea, like you should always be trying. You should always always be working for our approval, for our inclusion, but you're never gonna get it. Um, and that's America in a nutshell. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Zakara. Um, I wanted uh, to ask you really quick, uh, Imani, I was listening to your uh, conversation earlier with Bethany about uh, the need to use hashtags and, you know, the um, moving sort of away from blogs into Twitter. And then as we all know, Twitter right now is a big mess. Um, but I wanted to talk about like how important online spaces are in, in sort of having access and truly like a unified space where and everybody is able to access um, materials in a way that is, I don't know how else to explain it, like easily accessible, I don't know, uh, for folks, primarily because um, when I was in my MSW program and I was talking about how I don't really identify as like oh, are you more Arab? Are you more Latina? And it's like, no, I'm much more disabled rather than any other identity that other people may put on me because the way that I interact, my culture, the words I use, the way I talk, my over gesticulation, my over 
uh, compensation for communication deficits or too much, whatever you want to call it. Like online makes everybody like unified. I don't have, you know, disabled people don't have a, a town square where everybody goes and meets and it's like, hey, this is how we interact. But the town square is really Twitter and it's TikTok and it's these places where all of us can gather together. And so I wanted to talk about like both the strength, but the fragility of online spaces as uh, sort of the disabled town square. Yeah. Um, so going back historically, when I mentioned the ugly laws, disabled people's presence in the public square as it exists in our communities, in society, uh, in in person, like in a physical form, is very limited due to the accessibility that exists in those spaces. I've gone to, con like, I've seen disabled people tweet, um, you know, tweet, uh, like, pictures from them going to conferences that are specifically for disabled people, and there's no ramps. There's no ASL interpreters. There's, like, no, like, they created a space for us, but the space didn't really exist for us, it existed as a performance that they included us. Um, and so when it comes to online spaces, we exist in online spaces on our own terms. And um, I remember when I first started Twitter, the my favorite thing to do, because I would call myself disabled all the time, non-disabled people would fight me. They would argue with me that I was calling myself disabled. They would get so angry that I was calling myself disabled. And um, this is not this is not like appropriate. I, I don't think, but I would cuss them out because like not not be and and I know it sounds like oh I'm just fighting, but it was a strategic move because one of the first things people tell, one of the first things you learn about disability is that they infantilize disabled people. And what is the first thing you stop telling children to do? Stop cussing. So I would cuss them out. Like so I was like I was like utilizing these perceptions of what disability couldn't be in order to like get them to leave me alone and, and they didn't want to interact with me but disabled people saw that and were like yes I love it let's go and, and that's kind of how like a lot of my um presence started and in these online spaces we get to dictate who we are mm -hmm. um outside of what people see our bodies as capable of or our minds or how we speak or how we hear or how we see like that's on our terms exactly. um and unfortunately billionaires seem to just think of these spaces as places where they make more money. Mm -hmm. And for us, it has literally meant our survival. I've seen disabled people compare and contrast me methods of accessibility, like tools that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. People seeing themselves, seeing themselves represented on wheelchairs, on crutches, black people, like the sheer number of black people with mobility aids that are just visibly disabled on the internet these days is amazing and something I could have I could have used to see when I was younger. So it always baffles me um, that these billionaires will buy pieces of the internet and then not really know how the internet functions. Like there's a magic to the discoverability of yourself and seeing yourself and understanding parts of your community that you were not always given access to. Um, and it infuriates me because thing, it makes things so much harder. You know, they built an accessibility after disabled people asked for it. They have alt, cap alt text and, um, excuse me, captions on videos and all these things. And that's stuff that disabled people fought for because we were able to come together in a space on our own terms. Right. Uh, for example, um, I work primarily with folks that are neurodivergent and it's mm -hmm. only after getting in some of these Facebook groups and Twitter like communities that we're able to sort of come together and it's like, oh, well, I found out that I can get this kind of uh, free sensory material samples from this person and maybe this might be helpful for you 
or like, hey, this person is able to make custom weighted blankets as opposed to the mass produced weighted uh, uh, blankets. So this can be really helpful for when you're working at home or hey, this table is particularly helpful because it's adjustable. So you can work from bed or you can work from home in a way that is maybe not, um, that maybe you didn't know about before. And it's only through being in these Facebook, these Twitter, this, these TikTok communities online where this information is easily disseminated. Whereas relying on what would be like the ethnic or the culture, the pre other kinds of standards of community has sort of not always helped uh, disabled people get the resources that they need. And I think one of the most interesting and the most exciting thing that I see on social media is people of diverse cultures talking about how their cultures interact with disability in spaces where their cultures are recognized by other people in their um, that that share their their identity. You know that is exciting to me because we have to unravel the way white supremacy has played a very big role in how disability is socialized, but also it it has also dictated how our own cultures have interacted with disability and how we could do better by one another. And so I think that that is a really exciting um, vantage point uh, of social media. If anything, I wanna um, talk a bit more about this because since we're talking specifically to social workers in uh, this conference, we are the people who then go on to review uh, Medicaid and Medicaid waiver uh, applications. We then go on to uh, approve SSI or SSDI applications either here in the United States and then in very similar programs abroad if we're able to have those uh, opportunities given uh, if we're able to have those opportunities. So what ends up happening is that, um, and I know this from experience, I used to work in the state of Illinois uh, Division of Developmental Disability, and yeah. there, there was a kind of performance that people in the community needed to put on in order to have their application approved for say, uh, uh, personal support workers uh, for community integrated uh, job placements to make sure that they're not institutionalized. And yeah. other, and for example, um, so I used to, the my, my job placement was in the South side of Chicago. I worked primarily with black and Latino folk. And so I needed to make sure to understand that like, okay, how do I make sure that I don't force them to perform whiteness, that I don't force themselves to perform this hyper independence that America is really based on and allow them to perform interdependence or cultural dependence, but still be able to get the resources that they need to survive and to be alive. So a big one is like, how are, I, I this is a long preamble to what are some of the uh, ways that maybe social workers should, uh, should consider a uh, cultural um, identity intersecting with disability in a way that is not just like out of the textbook, but like real lived experiences that maybe are not available in our textbooks. Yeah, so when it comes to um, culture and disability, it's really fascinating because disabled people in general have to walk this very, very fine line. You have to be disabled enough to, to get the support but not too disabled to get institutionalized um, and sometimes even imprisoned um, due to your the appearance of your disability. Um, and I can only speak for the black community because I don't want to overstep my bounds. There are other communities that I think you should reach out to uh -huh. uh, as it pertains to their own cultural implications of disability. But I always find it really, really difficult to connect black people with resources on disability um, because they don't want to identify as disabled. And historically, uh, historically during enslavement, uh, black people were given rations based on their productivity. Um, so they would literally starve to death if they didn't produce enough due to disability. Um, and that's how our as social security functions now. But that's a that's a tell for a different day. But um, <laughs> you know. So disability, you know, disability has literally mean de meant death. We also have to consider too that, you know, 30 to 50% of people killed by police have a disability. And when you consider the intersection of both race and disability, 
there, there's a real big fear that the state is going to act upon your life yet again. Mm -hmm. um, and so I used to work for a protection advocacy agency. Um, I don't know if you all know about those. They're in every single state. Um, they're great resources if you need help advocating for a disabled person. Um, but anyways, they would literally ask you on the call, do you have a disability? What is your diagnosis? And some people could not get over, over that hurdle of saying, I have a disability. I have this diagnosis. Um, and so one of the ways that I tried to say, that I tried to like think about it is ask them about like what the, where the pains are. Like well, maybe ask them what the official diagnosis is, but like you got a little touch of something. Always minimize it a little bit because there's a, I'm telling you, like people will shut down. Right. If you even bring up the word disability in some black spaces. Um, there's also this idea of like this toxic equality that comes about when it comes to disability. And this isn't just, this isn't just um, related to black folks. I see this a lot regardless, but people will say, oh, you don't have to treat me any differently. I'm not disabled. I don't, I don't need to be treated differently. I just need this help of A, B, and C. And then you have to tell them to perform a disability a little bit in order to get those resources. Um, you have to walk a very fine line in terms of, in terms of getting people that aid. And sometimes it takes talking around the issue for a very long time. And that's where those communal spaces come in. That's where that like prerequisite conversation for black folks come in. Like, how are you? How is your day? How's your day? And what, you know, what's going on? Like, well, how can I help you being casual and personable with the person across from you as much as possible yeah. um, is incredibly important. Humanizing them first is incredibly important. Of course. And I also think structurally there is a connection as well, right? Like when you think about access to competent therapists to get cognitive diagnosis, right? First off, you have to find a therapist and then you have to find one who understands your cultural expression of, you know, the, the markers of the diagnosis, right? And yeah. so I think that's also an issue, um, especially if you're not in like a, a, a city, right? I'm in a rural area that's predominantly white. And yeah, there are therapist but it's three month wait list and then when I find one I'm hoping that they you know can can actually help me and if not then I go back on the waiting list um and so when it comes to like access to resources you have to often have that diagnosis to get access to supports right and if you don't have access then that prevents you from getting supports um and it's a cycle too because you also have to pay for that diagnosis and sometimes these these diagnoses are thousands of dollars. These are not. This is not like just go to your go to your like the corner clinic and get a diagnosis and come back to Social Security or Medicaid and be like, this is what I have. This is what I need help with. These are lengthy, expensive processes, yeah. and it's kind of like I need the money to get the diagnosis, but if without the diagnosis, I can't get the money, right? And so people just kind of give up after this being on this like hamster wheel of how complicated the system actually is. If anything, I want to add an additional wrinkle. We also, um, because I mostly work, I only work with neurodivergent folk. We have really high uh, racial inequalities regarding uh, neurodivergent diagnoses, especially for young black boys. Young black mm -hmm. boys can be performing the exact same way as a young white boy. And depending on where you received your mental health training, you are much more likely to see a young black boy as uh, overly defiant and diagnose them with ADHD as opposed to uh, autism, thereby like forcing them into a lifetime of receiving the wrong kinds of medications, the wrong kinds of support, and not getting access to the types of um, accessible tools or accommodations that would be uh, uh, much more like readily available if we had the correct diagnosis. I see people every single day in here, this office, where um, they come in and they're like, I know something is wrong because I keep thinking this way and I'm having to like, as a provisionally licensed social worker, I'm having to work with my clinical directors to be like, how can we get them like the the accessible tools that they need with only a therapy diagnosis as opposed to a full medical diagnosis mm -hmm. and it's uh, it can be extremely difficult because white boys and young white girls are much more likely to receive those diagnoses 
for free through schools and we're having to pay for them in adult yes. life. And it's fascinating because I constantly get that question. Um, there's also a fear too in the black community that black children are overdiagnosed. Um, and so I get a lot of questions like, are, do you think black people are overdiagnosed with you know, a B, or, a, B or C? And it's really all over the place. Because you get people that are overdiagnosed, you get people that are underdiagnosed, and then you get people that are completely just misdiagnosed. And it's all over the place. And what it all boils down to is a lack of attention to how disability presents culturally mm -hmm. and, to how, and how to interact with different communities. Um, and this isn't, like I said, it's not just for Black folk, it's for a whole host of communities of color. Like this is a huge problem. And when you think about the DSM-5 and you talk, you think about diagnosis in general, it's all off the basis of whiteness. Right. It all is. So we have to go back to the drawing board entirely and really take detailed notes about what it looks like for different types of people. Right. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you said that because I literally wrote that and said white norms is the problem, mm -hmm. right? The, the field of mental health, like social work, is born in colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. And that means the field had a purpose to fu a function. And so we're always trying to sort of figure it out and there are going to be contradictions. The field has, like, even if we don't take the disparities, right? Like, if we just take the disparities, at face value, the diagnosis force us to like align with white norms. And mm -hmm. so when you ask about the expression of, you know, how does how do black women express, you know, STEM differently than other cultures, right? Like mm -hmm. it or is that diagnosis is the depression experienced by a young black male the same as a rich white man, right? Is that the same diagnosis? And right. I think we take for granted that they are because they have been, but I do think that, you know, there is room to like, let's just rethink this and co-create this together because something is wrong, but it may not be that. And I think that's also a hesitance of black folks to want to take on these diagnoses because something is wrong, but it may not be that. Exactly. I think too, people are tired. I think people are exhausted um, with their own survival and ha adding one more thing to their plate, whether it be investigating these diagnoses, getting these diagnoses, it's just exhausting. Um, and I, I think it was like FDR or somebody was attempt or Kennedy was attempting to really kind of create community centers for mental health care. And we basically were like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, like we kind of shrugged our shoulders as a society. And what I really think we need, what I really think we need to contend with is how do we place value on a system? How do we place value on making a system work for people for whom the system has already discarded? And that's really what it boils down to to me is that once you're disabled, you're seen as not valuable to society. So anything you get, like I said before, is deemed an extra. It's deemed as, as you know, you're lucky you get this. You're lucky we even pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. You're lucky, you know, you may be black and disabled and and, and have um, societal issues that you deal with every single day, but you're lucky we let you live. And we need to place more value on disabled lives, particularly knowing the way it is weaponized against marginalized communities. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, as you were speaking, right, I'm just sitting here and I love to ideate, right? Like I'm, I'm um, uh, Adrian Marie, uh, Adrian Marie, Brown, I think pleasure activism um, mm -hmm. and emergent strategy is like she does this method of generative ideation where, you know, there is no sort of goal, but like, let's see what comes out of it. And as you were talking about tired, right, and just being tired, I'm thinking about the work that I'm doing with Black women and, and using AI to sort of steal time back, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think there is a space and a way to ideate around how to steal some cognitive bandwidth back by mm -hmm. using ADI, A, excuse me, um, AI, especially for folks with disabilities and cognitive disabilities, right? So I'm neurodivergent to the extent that when I'm taught, like 
sometimes the words don't come, right? I know what I want to say. And so one of the things that I do is go to chat GPT and like type in what I can get out and then use that to like help me to verbalize exactly what it is I'm saying, right? And so um, can you, do you know of any ways that new technologies, right, can help folks steal time back in this space where we always have to do extra to get our needs met. We always have to do extra, right, to, to meet white norm standards, right? Um, do you have any tips or strategies that you can share with folks um, to sort of alleviate some bandwidths and spaces to have time to rest and recuperate? I think the greatest issue for me as a Black woman is the pressure of perfection and getting it right the first time. Um, that's, and I think for me, it's not, it's not necessarily the technology. It's more the idea of how can we represent one another learning out loud? Like it's okay not to know things. It's okay to be behind the curve in some things. And I think what society demands of black women because we are we are black women and black trans folk and black disabled folk because we are marginalized on multiple axes of blackness is that when we are in spaces regardless, um, including some black spaces, we are supposed to show up perfectly. We are supposed to show up all knowing and with every answer on the table already. We are to be more prepared than anybody else in order to participate in conversations and to be valued members of the room. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody that's horrible at it too. Like I, I want to be seen as like, if you notice on my social media, I don't talk about anything I don't know about. It's not my place. Cause I'm, I don't want to speak out of turn and then ruin something, ruin a conversation that I wasn't supposed to be a part of to begin with. But in terms of like skill sets and dreams and goals and business or social work, whatever you want to be a part of, I think it's really important that we decide to learn out loud mm -hmm. and that we decide to show that there's a little, there's a lot more nuance to who people are than what social media is showing us. And I think social media gives us the opportunity to do that. Uh, it's not going to be easy because again, we don't want to misstep at any turn. But as long as we're respectful of the people that have come before us, of the people who are engaged in conversation before us, and the communities that we may be speaking about or the experiences we may be speaking about, we have to be, we have to be genuine, hum, uh, exercise humility, and be respectful. But I think we can you know, let go of some of that pressure to constantly perform perfection. Um, and it, we can do it in little ways, we can do it in large ways. And I think technology, um, as it pertains to kind of getting some of that bandwidth, I, I, do, I do like the idea, but I do kind of worry about, um, again, that perfection. Like, Chappie GBT is great. However, you don't want to be accused of not doing your own work as a Black person, mm -hmm. right? You also don't want to be um, seen taking the easy way out, um, uh, which I don't think it is. I just want to be clear about that. But I want to make sure that people realize that, you know, technology is great, but I think it all comes out of this idea that we can't take our time, mm. that we can't take a pause, that we can't rest a little bit and think about things because we have to keep going, going, going and doing so in lockstep with how it should be. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, thank you for implicit permission to uh, just chill a bit, because that's what I heard. <laughs> chill out a little bit, just, just a little bit. Gotcha. You know, I, yeah. I was going to say, um, even uh, in like the micro level of social work, just working one to one uh, in direct practice, I in implementing like disability justice, literally my day, all day, every day is telling folks, you need to chill out. You need to actually look at what self-care means to you. Let's not do the bubble bath. Let's not do the nails. Let's not do yoga. Let's, what is it helpful for you? Because I work at a practice that um, 
is like integrated medicine and we have like a wellness center and whatever. But beyond that, it's like, okay, what, like, forget what other people, what white society is telling you about like, what it means to rest, what is restful to you? What, like, what is actually affirming to you? I know so many people for whom scrolling on TikTok is the most calming thing in the world, primarily because um, it provides the visual stimulation that they don't get anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So it, it it is both, yes, take a chill pill, but also what is your specific chill pill? Well, and... Yeah capitalism still happens, right? Like you still have to pay bills. And I think we can get into this la la world of like, you know, don't do this and take rest. But we also know that folks who share these multiple intersections experience financial hardships too, right? And so just thinking about like, what are ways we can free up some of that time under the constraints of capitalism? Yeah, I agree. And I think that the hardest part about, you know, real self-care is looking at yourself. Like that's what, because that's the real root of it. You have to take a look at yourself and like through really stark lenses and say where you're weak and where you're needing and where you're inadequate and then figuring out what the, what, what fits in those pieces to help you through your day. Um, and that's a hard process to go through. Um, I, it's hard for everybody. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, operating under capitalism too. Um, I feel like when it comes to self-care telling the people you have to tell to take self-care are always, always, um, understand the weight of capitalism, you know? And I think that it's very difficult for them to take that time to look inward. Um, and I don't fault them for it because we all struggle with it, you know? For sure. And y'all, this conversation is beautiful and I hate to (laughs) come in and be like, shut it down. (laughs) But that is the the constraints of time. And so I just want to say thank you. I appreciate y'all so much. Uh, Sakara, Naime for being here, for y'all presence in this space. Uh, Thank you again. And of course, thank you so much to Amani for being here. It was amazing. Yes. Amazing. And we just so appreciate everything about you. So please, please take all of this, all of those compliments and, and just like know that everything that you do is amazing. So thank you for, for being our closing guest today. And finally, thank you all for being here, our audience. Uh Please look out for our information around evaluations for this closing session and for all of the breakouts and the opening plenary. Please take the time to fill out the evaluations. If you register for CEUs, you will be receiving those um, soon by email. So keep an eye out for those. And once again, all of our sessions have been recorded and they will be available on our website shortly. So please keep an eye from those and go back and watch the breakout sessions you didn't get to see. Rewatch this panel and take it in again. Rewatch our opening session. And again, just thank you for being here. And hopefully next year we will have an amazing conference for you all again with just as many amazing guests. And take care, go take care of yourselves. Um, thank you. Thank you. Bye.